Thank you very much, Father. It's wonderful to be introduced by a friend, isn't it? It's, uh, it's just very nice. My uh, father would have been very proud to hear that. My mother would have believed it. <laughs> <laughs> We have a custom at Ave Maria University of beginning with the prayer, and if I could sing, I would lead it myself, but I need a volunteer to do twice the refrain, Ubi Caritas et Amor. There are lots of singers in this group. Does somebody, can somebody help us with it? Just start, please, please. Well. I like the other one better, if, if it's right. <laughs> Do you know the other one? There's Ubi Caritas et Amor. Ubi Caritas et Amor. One more time. Ubi Caritas et Deus ibis. Thank you. That's, to my mind, the most beautiful refrain in the whole Christian tradition, but I love it. Uh, anyway, a young Catholic today, and uh, forgive me if I address myself particularly to the young, um, you'll see from my theme why that's important to, to focus on. But a young Catholic today inherits a long tradition of reflection on love that is unmatched in any other tradition in the world. The young Catholic begins with the sublime Song of Songs of the Jewish Testament and the many sections of the Christian te uh, Testament dedicated to love. I especially cherish chapter 4 of the first epistle of St. John, that uh, no one sees God. How then do we know that we love God? Then there's St. Augustine's wonderful reflection on the civilization of love in the city of God, and also on disordered eros and concupiscentia in the confessions. My personal all-time favorite exposition is the De Caritate of St. Thomas Aquinas. Although not all scholars see this point, caritas is the inner drive of the whole thought of St. Thomas, naming both the inner life of the creator and the dynam inner dynamic of the universe, and not least, the central longing of the Lord's most beautiful creation, the human person. As Jacques Maritain once wrote, by its liberty, the human person transcends the stars and the world of nature. In more recent times, the Catholic Library on Love includes the brilliant study by Martin Darcy, S.J., The Mind and Heart of Love, a really wonderful book from 1947, and perhaps the most penetrating book of all, if I may include the great writer of the English Catholic tradition, C.S. Lewis, The Allegory of Love in 1936. A dense and difficult book, but just a mind-blowing book. The theme of Lewis in that book is the dazzling history in the invention of the story of romantic love, now the most standard of all loves, recognized in the Western world. It's, it's a Western invention. And it appears that only Westerners share this view of love and this practice of love. Wet, romantic love is a Western invention with a date and a near obsession. Supposedly, it's the key to all happiness. For Lewis, the invention of, of romantic love in the age of the troubadours that's the age of the Crusades. The men are off in the East, the women alone, running the farms and estates and kingdoms of most of Europe. Uh, women achieved their secret ambition. They were ruling the world. 
Uh, you know, that's, um, forgive me uh, for saying this, but uh, as a matter of principle, um, for a good marriage, the husband ought to have the last word. As a matter of practical wisdom, the last word better be, yes, dear. <laughs> Lewis says that the invention of romantic love in the 12th century was far more momentous for the development of the West and far more broadly influential than, say, the Protestant Reformation. Lewis compares the Reformation to a ripple on the vast ocean of romantic love. Now, another contemporary exposition, and I want to talk about this because if we, if we fail to grasp what love means to the inner ear of most people today in the West, we will breed a systematic misunderstanding when we use words because that isn't what they will be thinking of, particularly with eros. Another contemporary exposition of this powerful theme is presented in one of the best books I read during my university years. It's not a great book, but it's really stimulating. And it's Love in the Western World, it's called, Denis de Rougemont. A passion in Society, it's called in English. In fact, let, in England, I should say. In fact, let me open my response to von Hildebrand's great, deep, and demanding study by, by taking up the meaning most often attached to the term love in literature, theater, opera, and cinema today, namely the theme of romantic love. Unless we are clear about the most common of all usages of love, <clears throat> we will systematically misunderstand von Hildebrand's great achievement. The myth of romantic love then versus von Hildebrand's larger sense of eros. My dear wife once described the love that an earlier suitor had shown for her. He loved loving me. He didn't love me. That's exactly the nub of de Rougemont's analysis. We Westerners have come to think that the central fire of human happiness is romantic love, love forever and ever, love happily ever after. Imagination ends with a romantic couple walking hand in hand across the fields toward the sunlight. Many people spend their entire lives looking for such love, wanting to feel such love, wondering when they are first attracted to a guy or a girl, if that's what they're now feeling or not. Is this what being in love is? And it is true, most people above all love being in love. Love the feeling of loving. Love even the mad passion of being in love more than they love the other. There's extremely exquisite, painful uh, example of this in a beautiful book, which I've been reading on the airplane coming over, Sheldon Van Aken's book, A Severe Mercy. After a most intense love, with the love of his life, Davy, her nickname was, uh, for something like 20 years, uh, she died suddenly. But th there's something beautiful, touching, expanding about the love. I remember, I think, the love between my wife and me was so wonderful, but I was reading this, like, boy, that's even more wonderful. For a little while, then I got to think, oh, no, this is... The point is, Van Aken's view, Van Aken's view and that of his wife, was that they should keep the feeling of in-loveness perfectly alive, intense forever. And I, I think that's a nightmare. Uh, um, I mean, it required such discipline of them, such a shrinkage of their lives. For one thing, it meant ruling out children. Now, you know, once you've had grandchildren, 
you realize you actually, there's so much fun, you could have skipped the children, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. De Rougemont points out several features of romantic love. Central among these, these is the fact that it consists in falling in love with love, not with a concrete person. In its high form, it scorns merely bodily, erotic, and sexual love. In its low form, that's all it's been reduced to. I mean, the myth of romantic love, the great myth of romantic life has dropped the romance dropped even the love and gone directly to the bodily coupling, hooking up in the universities, it's called in America. But in this high form, it prides itself, and that's, this is the most interesting feature of it, because it's, it's it shows it's a form of the old Gnosticism, a hatred of the human body, a hatred of human reality, a hatred of the human condition. It prides itself on being above the biological love that is satisfied by pornography or by groping interaction with another human being, that's what it's descended into. But romantic love, in its beginnings, loves the higher passion, the spiritual ecstasy of love, not the body. A woman in romantic love loves being swept off her feet, longing for more to the point of death. I would rather die than lose the feeling of loving him and being loved by him. To quote de Rougemont, passion, the other important word here, passion, means suffering. In fact, you can only say passion, passion. It's the, it's the language it was, it was meant for. Um, passion means suffering, something undergone, the mastery of fate over a free and responsible person. To love love more than the object of love, to love passion for its own sake, has been to love to suffer and to court suffering all the way from Augustine's amabam amare, I loved loving, to modern romanticism. To feel the ecstasy of passion, romantic love entails a boundless desire, a longing for the infinite, a longing to slip the surly bonds of time, to escape from bodily limitations, into the realm of the forever and the infinite. De Rougemont describes it as complete desire, luminous aspiration, the primitive religious soaring carried to its loftiest perch, a desire that never relapses, that nothing can satisfy, that even rejects and flees the temptation to obtain its fulfillment of, in this world. That's the most interesting thing about it. It's not aimed at fulfillment in this world. It's, aimed at building up obstacle after obstacle so you never quite get there. It's the chase, it's the passion of the thing that is so thrilling. It is a revolt against mere flesh, against the limits of the human condition. The body, it finds gross. What it loves is the rarefied spiritual passion that only romantic lovers know. They think they are a higher, higher type of lover. It loves feeling lifted above the herd into a higher sphere. Romantic love, quote again, is a transfiguring force, something beyond delight and pain, an ardent beatitude, pure, more spiritual, more uplifting than physical hooking up. It's not a sated appetite, but in fact, quite the opposite. It loves the feeling of never being satisfied of being always caught up in the longing, of dwelling in the sweetness of desire. It feels a kind of murderous hostility to any rude awakenings of fleshly, human, ordinary things. That's why romantic love desperately needs obstacles. The movie starts, people are in love, and then there's just one obstacle after an obstacle so that it's never consummated. If romantic love were to lead too quickly to physical consummation, it would cease being romantic. For then it would require dealing with clothing in disarray, a mess to clean up, bad breath, and hair all disheveled. Then there would be a meal to fix, and bump, romance has fallen back to the lump on earth. 
Now, for the sake of romantic love, it's much better for fulfillment to be delayed, for obstacles to be put up, for the sword to be laid down between the longing couple or a curtain drawn between them. For the romantic passion to persist, lovers must be kept away from one another. De Richemont comments on romantic lovers, their need, for, for their need of one another is in order to be aflame, and they do not need one another as they are. What they need is not one another's presence, but one another's absence. <laughs> this is a story of love perennially facing obstacles, never having to get down to the nitty gritty of daily life. If and when Eros in this sense does vanquish all obstacles, it ceases to be romantic love. It now must choose between a commitment to a concrete other with all the limitations of that other or a once and for all breakup. For with consummation, illusion is shattered. Flesh meets flesh. The reality of the human condition sets in. So this brings us to a final point. The most satisfactory ending for the tale of romantic love is not, as one would think, physical conservation or even growing old together. It is actually death. While longing still pierces the heart, death. For then the living member of the couple can go on loving infinitely forever above the ordinariness of mere earth. Or else if that empty fate is simply unbearable, the remaining beloved can also meet a tragic death. Now that's really satisfying. When a man and a woman continue in eternal love through the untimely death of both. That's when the movie is just heart-wrenching. That's a real tragedy, the real arrow of love to the heart, the best of all Western tales. Now this tale does have a history. Its birth has been tra traced to the 12th century in the story of Tristan and Isolde. In modern times, theater go goers will best remember its all-time classic expression in Romeo and Juliet. In fact, there are thousands of novels, operas, stage plays, and movies ricocheting off this dynamic theme, de Rougemont puts it. Our eagerness for both novels and films with their identical type of plot, the idealized eroticism that pervades our culture and upbringing and provides the pictures that fill the background of our lives. Just look at the advertising in Rome. I just came from Moscow, in R Moscow now. Uh, this idealized longing. And every ad for underwear, perfume, you name it. It's always this, this idealized longing that is hit. Thick fills the background of our lives. Our desire for escape, which a mechanical boredom exacerbates. Everything within and about us glorifies passion. Romantic love has become the favorite food and drink of the Western world. Our entertainment, our, our recreation, our leisure time, and our imagination. Now, there is something about the Christian emphasis on monogamy. I think it's not an accident that this arose in the West, in the Christian part of the world, because there's something about the Christian emphasis on monogamy that no doubt gives spur to this new myth of romantic love, this new escape from reality, this delectable titillation. That is why the story of the triangle that recurs again and again in the popular culture of the West, even today, the triangle of love, in which at least one party is in a hopeless position, <coughs> caught between an unbreakable bond of monogamy and a powerfully attractive, yet maybe unattainable other. <coughs> the troubadour may sing softly and sweetly to the lady, and she may in her loneliness and longing be deeply touched. It's been a year, it's been two years, her husband is away. She swayed, powerfully tempted, just this once, just for a little while. Who could blame me? Lines are beginning to appear on my face. I, I, I'm getting older. And thus it sometimes happened, as poets later observed, that when the handsome troubadour and the lady sang together softly and sweetly in the garden, the music slowly came to a stop. That day, they sang no more. 
Sometimes the triangle was worked from the other side. The traveling young knight on his way to and from the Holy Land seeks lodging at a castle for the knight, or perhaps even longer to be healed of his wounds. He and the young lady of the household, both lonely, talk sometimes for hours. Sometimes there are gentle, almost lingering caresses. Yet it's the duty of the knight not to dally, not to compromise the purity of the married lady, but rather to practice the strictest self-control over himself. There's a beautiful example of this contest in the wonderful ballad, Sir Gawain, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I doubt if many today have ever read a dalliance so beautifully sweet, so delicate and redolent of mutual attraction, in which, although by not much of a margin, chastity wins out. <laughs> Do not too many of the young persons you know believe that true happiness is to be found in true romantic love? They may not know how to distinguish true romantic love, but they seek desperately to try it out so that at last they can be happy as in the movies and that everything else they've seen. For so many, happiness means romantic love. Do not many long to be swept off their feet? Be honest. You almost certainly remember this wistfulness in yourself, those of us who were older long ago. Perhaps still, even at your present age, you tend to think of that romantic love, a true passion, as the French used to call it, was once, or still is, the highest, sweetest peak in your life. We all know people who refuse to be bound by an earthly commitment to any one concrete, imperfect human being. Instead, they fall in love with love over and over again until death brings them rest. Now, if this were something like it is what de Rougemont meant by the means by the eros of romantic love, it was, it was born in the 12th century, it is important for us to know that von Hildebrand uses eros in a totally different sense. He generally gives to the ancient Greek term eros a much broader meaning which includes nearly all forms of natural love. He both praises the goodness to be found within eros and marks out its limitations, its seductions, and its destructive capacities in human lives. <laughs> Von Hildebrand means by eros the kind of drive, the strong attraction, the longing for something beyond the finite that one can experience in many different kinds and types of love. All the forms of love seem to lead higher to an, yet another form of love. In fact, eros in the sense of von Hildebrand may even be the kind of drive that leads one to disdain romantic love. I mean, if romantic love is a drive, there can be a deeper eros, a deeper drive, leading one to see the inadequacies of romantic love and arouse the longing for a realistic love, property human beings, property to, to two fleshly creatures, pro property to two people with many faults, each to be forgiven in the other. Yeah, marriage is uh, a lot of saying I'm sorry uh, and a lot of being asked for forgiveness. Mostly it's about good humor. If you have good humor, you have a good shot at the marriage, just being successful in a marriage, yeah, especially in bad situations. Um, when I was young, I was, when, when we were married, my wife wrote to her mother uh, saying her one worry was that I was so serious. And uh, it worried her. And she said she would have to carry the burden of humor in the family. <laughs> uh, and she always did. But, but uh, uh, she made me a much lighter person. I mean, it is true. You, you change. Although I have to give you a warning on that, too. Um, every woman tends to think that after marriage, her husband will change and he seldom does. And every man thinks that after marriage, his wife will never change, and she always does. <laughs> so <clears throat> Hildebrand is interested in leading us to a, a more realistic love, a real life love with another person. Concentrate on the other person, not on your idea of that person or even that other person's idea of herself. 
but on that person as she is, which remains for both of you to discover. I mean, you're not there. You're at the beginning of a voyage. And she's trying to learn better who she is, and you're trying to learn better who she is. And there's lots of room to miss <laughs> each other. Um, what von Hillebrand means by eros, then, is the drive that springs forward from other forms of love, lower on the ladder of love, and drives through romantic love itself in order to reach at last that natural friendship described by Aristotle, which in Latin is called amicitia. But eros of a sort drives humans to long for something still better than amicitia, still higher. It makes the heart restless until it rests in the infinite good. Even the highest natural love overshoots the fullness of nature. It longs for more. In a way, then, all forms of love are connected by a drive within each one of them to push higher. And this leads me to one of the things that most impressed me in von Hildebrand's book, the connectedness of all loves. It's really neat to see how many different forms of love. De Rougemont mentions there are 30 different types of love identified in Greek and Roman literature alone. You know, I, I get the seven. I don't know where he gets the 30, but <laughs> seven is quite enough. Um, um, but anyway, uh, von Hillebrand points out their connectedness. This is one of the most touching merits of von Hillebrand's very sensitive and probing acquire, inquiry into the nature of love. It's that he sees partly from his own experience that there are many, many forms of love and that they are all connected. He also sees that all loves, no matter how lowly or even how seductively dangerous, spring from God. That's why I like that ubi caritas et amor, ubi Christus et Deus est. In our freedom, we each have to learn the different tastes and ways of love. It's not a bad thing to do in life is to learn the different ways of love. In order to learn to choose wisely among them, in our freedom, not all, of us, not all within us is foreordained, but we have to become, in the image of God, our own providence. God, God made us to be our own providence. Um, that, that's what's so special, so precious, so beautiful about human beings. Well, how we are most like God, is to share a little bit in his providence. We are responsible for our own flourishing. We are, no one else is, responsible for shaping our own lives. As, even as we beg guidance from the source of a still more beautiful providence. But where von Hillebrand makes a truly great breakthrough in the philosophy of love is, is in his dissection of the differences within the triad, caritas and agape, the two highest of all loves, and amicitia. In natural friendship, two persons each choose the other in Amicitia, each choose the other as worthy of love and loyalty for their own sake, not for utility or pleasure. If you are in a jam or in a difficulty, you find out very quickly which of your friends loved you for pleasure or for utility, and not for when you're in difficulty. You, you, the number of friends who love you for yourself is much smaller than the number who love, who love you for other reasons. And it's, it, every human being experiences that, uh, the failure of friends. So already Aristotle has discovered something quite high, the capacity to, it's stated better in Aquinas than in Aristotle, but to love, to love is to love the good of the other, to will the good of the other. And, and as I said, you may not know for sure what the good is, or your image of what the good for that other is may, not, may be wrong. And that other person may not know what her good is either. And you're both struggling to find it. But to love is to, as it is, to, two eyes looking forward together. It's not looking into each other's eyes. It's looking toward the good of the other, trying to find it. Um, let us begin then with von Hildebrand's analysis of caritas. For all Christian writers on love, it's necessary to use a special term for this more than natural form of love, this gift of God. And the Latin term caritas has been the most serviceable. First of all, caritas is the most pointed name for the innermost life of God. God is love. Yeah. Ubi caritas et amor. 
the lower to the highest. Uh, there God is. But caritas is a love not like any other form of love, while yet it is the source and prototype of all other loves. Von Hillebrand writes, the spirit of caritas, which is essentially bound to love for God and love of neighbor, is not only compatible with the categorical identity of the different kinds of love, but it is the principle of the perfection of each kind of love in its specific genius. It's as if as this caritas is there already in the lower, and already leading through the higher, until it comes to caritas. Now, if von Hillebrand were a theologian, he would no doubt have moved at this point into an inquiry of how caritas functions in the, as the inner spring of the Trinity, passing from Father to the Word, the Son, to the Holy Spirit, um, and the processions of love, the fire that makes the whole universe go, the, the drive, the, the impetus uh, to suffuse itself, to spread itself. One of the most characteristic features of caritas and of other loves is how you have the desire to diffuse it. My daughter called once from Cambridge, England, where she was studying, and it was a little cold. And I mean, people are not quite so gregarious as in the United States. They're a bit more reserved, uh, a, bit, a bit more understatement, and um, so forth. And she was terribly lonely. I was so worried about it, I started making plans to take a trip there to try to get a lecture at Cambridge so I could come and visit, just drop in and see how she was doing. And then I called her uh, about a month later or three weeks later, and she was just so happy and effusive. And she was going, I said, Tanya, have you met a guy? <laughs> and she said, how did you know? <laughs> <God>. <laughs> Love is diffusive of itself. You can't help it. You know? it's, uh, anyway, it, it, I'm trying to show it's a drive, this, this thing. It, it, it moves outward. But von Hildenbrand is, in fact, a philosopher. So he begins instead with an observable human fact. There have been acts of love that have appeared rather frequently in history, which are quite different from any other acts of love that have appeared in classical history or even in non-Christian modern history. This love, which is a special kind of love for God, has unique characteristics. Von Hillebrand examines Caritas from the human side. I think this is really important to see. He's writing as a philosopher. But you can see in history certain events which need some reflection and explanation. So he examines from the human side, open to philosophical investigation, rather than from the theological side, dependent on what humans learn from Jewish and Christian revelation. As a philosopher, he, he learns from that, but he sets it aside in his argument. To understand the special love of caritas philosophically, it's necessary first to clarify how its meaning is distinct from, but related to, the term for the love which Jesus Christ wore for the human race, the Greek word agape. In the words of von Hildebrand, agape is the real Christian love of neighbor that sees neighbors in the light of the fact that they are infinitely loved by Christ, who died on the cross for them. Agape or agape means permanently to be a man for others. It means a man who lays down his life for his friends. It means self-sacrifice. Now true, in the New Testament, agape is sometimes used interchangeably with caritas. But in modern usage, the connotations of the two terms diverge quite sharply. In the second half of the 20th century, Protestant writers tended to favor agape and to emphasize, above all, its self-sacrificial aspect. I'm thinking of Negrin and many other writers, even Reinhold Niebuhr. Among Catholic writers, however, caritas tends to be the preferred term. Not only does it best name the love that constitutes God's own inner nature, a theological point, it also names a kind of love that has been visible in human experience ever since Christ on the cross forgave his murderers and his legions of martyrs forgave those who martyred them. For von Hildenbrand, and in reality, Caritas and Agape are in this respect alike. 
How do we know if we love God by caritas and agape? By this do you know, if you have love for one another, and in particular, if you find it in yourself to love your enemies, then you are moved by caritas and agape. We don't see God, but our closest experience of him is in this experience of love and love for enemies. Now, now for von Hildebrand, nevertheless, caritas and agape are not the same. The love for God, caritas, and the love of neighbor, agape, are obviously entirely different. The love for God is the purest value response, the value response par excellence. Love is born here and sustained by the infinite glory and holiness of the beloved, and this in a, in a way that is not found in any other kind of love. <coughs> love for God, caritas, and, and by the way, he switched, if you notice. He's now talking about our love for God, which is caritas. We're participating in God's caritas and loving God back with his own love, so to speak. But love for God, caritas, is not the same as love for neighbor, agape. Even though the two are intimately related. In a sense, it's caritas that issues forth in agape, just as it's the father who issues forth in the son. Caritas is, in a sense, the larger form of love. Now, in order to love one's enemies, it's not necessary to like them, to feel affection for them, to be moved by eros toward them, or even to choose to have them as friends. What is necessary, rather, is to make the effort to see in them what the Creator saw in them when before time was, he chose to create them. The Creator planted deep in them his own image. St. Thomas has a passage where he says that, that um, God is infinite. And so in order to mirror himself in the world, he had to create a virtual infinity of persons, each representing a facet of God. It's a, it's a lovely way to think about it. And if you hate somebody, or you ignore somebody, or you mistreat somebody, you're, you're distorting, you're avoiding, you're hurting an image of God that has something to teach you, and you're not getting it. Um, so the Creator planted deep in them his own image. To display the infinite facets of his infinite nature, God, as it were, needed to create a virtually infinite number of human beings, each bearing the imprint of one of those facets. We learn something about the face of God hidden deep within the hearts of our enemies, no matter the evil they have chosen, contrary, that evil they have chosen contrary to their own origin in God. There's no need to deny the evil that enemies have committed or to blind ourselves to the awful disfigurement that they have chosen to bring on themselves. They themselves have damaged the image of God in them. For our part, all that is required is that we see in them the promise God implanted there, the now disfigured but once pristine beauty that once radiated from them, and to understand that the gracious forgiving God who renders good for evil is ready to accept them back at, at their word, even in their last breath. It is what God sees in them that one loves in one's enemies. One does not have to accept Jesus as one's own savior to learn from his life and example how God sees into the hearts of sinners. Emphatically, one can see this in people in our own time. That is, once Christian, what I'm trying to say here is, once Christianity has entered into the world, it's really quite amazing how many people who never go to church still are moved by caritas. The wonderful line in Albert Camus, uh, what do they lack but churches, these humanists of our generation, who spend their lives giving to others? And he's, you know, thinking of some of the passages in the rebel, and uh, uh, yes, and uh, uh, in the plague, I should say. In departing from Aristotle and Eudaimonism, von Hildebrandt, to my taste, gives far too little explicit consideration to what was for the ancients the pinnacle of love, amicitia, which even Aquinas praises as nature's greatest model for the best of human loves. Aquinas values friendship for the very gifts Aristotle sees in it, especially in two respects. First, each of the two persons involved singles out one another, 
This form of love is called dilexio, and the root of it obviously is elexio. So it's, lo it's wonderful to have love or friendship toward another person, but if that love is unrequited, and that should happen to everybody, there's nothing more wonderfully bitter than unrequited love. <laughs> you should suffer on that hook a while. <laughs> and, uh, but it, then it is just so wonderful when the one you elect also elects you. I mean, two great acts of liberty to make amatitsya in, in, its, in its high form. And each singles out the other for a mutual bond of loyalty, esteem, and mutual striving for the good. That's just so important. You're mutually trying to find and become what God wants you to become fighting in the darkness to find it. Um, second, each loves the other not for the pleasure to be gained from love, not for the sake of being in love, um, and not for the utility that such love might offer to one's own life. Hey, I've got it for guys. I've got a good way to meet girls. Just get a wheelchair. <laughs> it's just been so wonderful. I mean, all these beautiful young women are just flocking around me to help me to... I wish I'd learned this years ago. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not just for the utility to love, not just for the utility that others uh, can uh, bring you, but to love the other for her own sake, for the good and the beauty that are in her. It's a happy characteristic of the Greek language that that term for beauty and for good, kalan, is the same. My wife used to be very careful with the word love. She almost never used it. Uh, it meant so much to her um, that she was very careful in using it. And I used to tell her often, because it gave me such pleasure to do so, um, did I tell you today that I love you? And um, I did it so often, she found it annoying. <laughs> because because I think the way I figured out, I mean, you never know quite what's going on in a woman's mind, but uh, the way I figured it out is, uh, is she felt if hearing that she'd have to reply, I love you, and, and she didn't like to do it so often. I mean, so it was special. And um, um, so I remember telling her once, look, when I tell you I love you, you don't have to reply. I'm not telling you in order to get you to reply. I'm just telling you because you're just so good and so beautiful uh, that you deserve to be loved. So I'm not trying to put any pressure on you. Uh, by anyway, further, one shows that this love by helping the other to advance with courage and persistence toward their own good. The result is that from their time spent together, true friends emerge larger souled and more splendidly beautiful and good persons than they were before. Von Hildebrand notes that two friends take, each take from their friendship mutual fulfillment, mutual flourishing. If the friends are moving in the sphere of faith, such a love often paves the way for caritas, but it's not the same as caritas. Amicitia sees the good in the other. Caritas goes beyond Amicitia, for the two friends now see in each other the image of God and see that the act of expressing their friendship expresses also their love for God, that is, expresses also caritas. It just gets swept up. They may also express their gratitude to God for lending to them the depth and power of his own caritas. God, God gives us the power of his caritas to participate in. We don't have to love with our own love. We, we, we can love with his love. The fire that he infuses into our own hearts so that each may be, love the other, not just with their own lives, but also with God's. And here too, the evidence of whether their love is accompanied by caritas is not found within their mutual relationship, strictly speaking, but in their disposition toward others, whether they both find it within themselves to forgive their enemies. Now, my wife, did that beautifully. She forgave all her own enemies. But she was hoping very much to outlive me because she would absolutely never forgive my enemies. 
She knew everybody who had ever said an unkind or mean word to me which she thought was untruthful, and she intended to get even once I was over. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, that's true. <laughs> they say the last thing in an Irishman that dies is his grudges. And uh, it's certainly true of my wife. Um, anyway. Um, My dear wife once commented on another friend of her youth who loved her. She had an awful lot of suitors before I came along. Huh? I, I've since learned there were at least five. If I'd known that, I'd been much more frightened than I was. Uh, my dear wife once commented on another friend of her youth who loved her, but could not bring himself to be kind to others or to show love or consideration for them. And that failure made her question the veracity and depth of his stated love for her. In an analogous way, a person who claims to love a friend but at the same time cannot see the need for loving others too may be failing even the tests of amicizia. For one sign of love is that it can hardly wait to diffuse itself in ever wider circles. I was telling about my daughter in love. Amicizia leads to generosity of soul. Where the latter is absent, one has reason to doubt the depth of the friendship. A man who claims that his amicizia is also suffused with caritas but who does not love his enemies is not seeing himself truly and is not living in the truth. Now, spousal love. It's characteristic of Von Hillebrand to write a generous passage such as this. In every natural love, even in the most imperfect, there is, insofar as it is love, a reflection of caritas, a certain image of it, a seed that tends to a fulfillment that this natural love can never attain by its own strength, but that it nevertheless calls for. This is why it's entirely false to deny any moral value to this purely natural, still unbaptized love and to treat it like a morally neutral instinct. It's not just morally neutral. It's, it's moving. It, it's on its way to God. Of all the natural love, spousal love is perhaps the most, undoubtedly the most beautiful, although the ancient Greeks did not so value it. It not only shares in all the values traditionally associated with amicizia, it adds in a specially poignant way the sort of love best named dilexio, which as the name suggests, consists in a considered choice, election, and commitment to one other person, single out from all others. I single you out for commitment and loyalty until death do us part. Uh, by the way, um, yesterday Rebecca was talking about the number of divorces, and I have to, she's absolutely right, but I have to point out the mistake made in the numbers. They, they count up the number of divorces in a year, and they count up the number of marriages in a year. And they say, one out of every two marriages ends in a divorce. Wrong conclusion. Another fact, she said, it points to the truth. Most people who are divorced get divorced two, three times. Elizabeth Taylor, nine times. Now. That means there are nine divorces, but there's only one Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> so if you count up the number of divorces there are in the United States, say the kingdom of divorces, um, uh, it's far vaster than the number of adults who have actually been divorced. Uh, the last time I checked, it's a while ago now, uh, but it was only 16 million Americans that had ever been divorced. But the number of divorces was four or five times that, for the reason I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out. In actual truth, 66% of all men and women who, in the United States, who promise to marry until death do them part, do. And when you consider how much longer it takes for death to part two people, that's really quite wonderful. <laughs> I mean, in the, in the 13th century or so, uh, the, in fact, right up to, right up to the French Revolution, um, the average age of, the average age of, the oppressed sex uh, at death was 24. And of the oppressor sex was 22. I mean, you know, divorce was no big deal. I mean, you didn't live long enough to get there. Uh, uh, it's an entirely different world now. And it, marriage is still batting 660, which nobody does in baseball. Um, <laughs> 
Okay, now when I, I'm, I'm getting very close to the end, forgive me, but spousal loves, uh, uh, but spousal loves also include what von Hillebrand calls the affectivity of loving. That is the whole panoply of affections from those inarticulate ones we share with our pets by stroking the fur of a cat or rubbing under the chin of the family dog and on up to the love resonant with the peerless affectivities of hug and caress, kiss, and simple abiding presence for two faithful spouses. To be sure, von Hillebrand prefers to use one term eros for all the kinds of love known to the ancient Greeks and Romans. And he prefers to stress the difference between all natural loves and those that come to us as gifts of the revealed God and as participations on our own part in the fires of his own inner life. So he likes best of all the contrast be between eros, all the natural loves together, and caritas and agape. He writes, for example, and if so we gather together all natural kinds of love, which are possible even among pagans, and call them eros, taking as the distinguishing mark of eros, not the categorial, categorial identity of any one of them, but rather the fact that they have not yet been transformed by Christ, that they are purely natural. And if we contrast eros in this sense with agape understood as the spirit of caritas, the incomparable quality of caritas, then we are contrasting eros and agape in a word that is not only fully justified, but that serves to point out something eminently important to the sphere of love. Now for my own part, I prefer in my own writings to dwell a bit more on the differences among the natural loves so that, so that the student of love can come to recognize, recognize love's many different kinds and shapes. I very much like von Hildebrand's emphasis on the unity of all these loves and the way in which the simpler and lower feed into the higher and more complex. It is, it is as if all loves aspire upwards. In the words of the great Flannery O'Connor, everything that rises must converge. All aspiring loves converge in one. Nonetheless, it's useful to notice the smaller differences. I like to tell tales of the seven kinds of love, affectio, amor, eros, amicizia, dilexio, agape, and caritas. And just telling little stories about each one of them builds up. It gives more power to the full sweep. Such an approach does not take away from von Hillebrand's preference for using eros to cover all the first five types of love. Indeed, at one point or another, Hildebrand too points toward, discusses, or at least mentions briefly, all seven of these loves. Now let me dwell in conclusion on at least one of them because of its importance in the beginnings of married love. It too is a general drive that moves through all the other natural forms of love, amor. Where would popular music be without an Italian amore? I mean, you'd have to cut out half the music on the air. Um, or in French, l'amour. Um, even the overworked English word love, you know, we only have one word for love. And all these other languages have seven. Um, we're such simple people. Uh, even indeed, the overworked English word love sounds more romantic if you say it in French or in Italian. Uh, Good clue for young lovers. Say it in French or Italian. <laughs> Amour seems to be the most general name for the force that draws things together, that pulls them, that attracts them to one another and holds them to one another. This force is imagined to be so general that it applies to inanimate non-human creatures like the stars and the sun, the forces of gravity, the regularity of natural motions. Therefore, St. Augustine could write, Amor meus pondus meum. My love, my weight. It's like the force of gravity. I'm pulled toward God. My love has the weight of gravity. Then Dante Alighieri wrote the following noble words among the most beautiful in all world literature. L'amor che muove sovra altre stelle. L'amor che muove sovra altre stelle. The love that moves the sun and all the stars. Among human beings, Amor points to the most general form of attraction even before a person gets to encounter a person. The baritone sings with a stranger for whom his heart begins to beat across the crowded room. Do you remember that song? 
I think it's Maurice Chevalier, if I'm not mistaken. Um, across the crowded room, I saw her. I didn't know her name. Um, in one of the best-loved biblical scenes, the heroine espies a speck moving across the edge of a distant field. And not even knowing whether the, the moving speck is human, let alone male, her heart leaps within her and she knows. It's her beloved for whom she has waited and he's at last approaching. She doesn't know him, she hasn't met him, but she's waited for him. And before she's met him, her heart has recognized him. In Anna Karenina, Tolstoy describes uncannily well the two strangers, male and female, lacing up their skates on opposite sides of the frozen pond, who suddenly become aware of and powerfully attracted to one another, and always seem to know where the other is on the ice, even when they do not look at one another. Each is even certain that the other knows even though they do not exchange a word, and even though they do not know one another's name, and they contrive to meet later, but they've already met. Um, amor is a wonderful force. Whatever its chemical or neurological basis, there is no doubt that something like electricity sometimes flashed between two persons unbidden when they are wholly unprepared. It even startled by the powerful feeling it enkindles. I, I was telling some youngsters last night at dinner that I went on a blind date. I was at Harvard and was invited, on a, which I wasn't terribly anxious to do. And I even remember when the phone rang, telling the yelling lady that I, I let's, yes, I'll be glad to take you to dinner, but I can only go 90 minutes because they have a bunch of papers to crack for tomorrow. Well, we sat down at a table and I looked into her blue eyes and in five minutes I decided this is the woman I'm gonna marry. Now, for prudence sake, I decided to wait a couple of days <laughs> to test it. <laughs> Um, but, I mean, there, sometimes that happens. Um, to, unfortunately, it took my wife another eight months to figure out that she ran out of reasons to say no, she said. Yeah. Uh, the, the, now, Amor is a wonderful force, but it, the feelings associated with her aren't trustworthy, to be sure. They are often just enough to give a couple the courage to speak to one another, to allow their eyes to look into each other's and to want to spend time with each other much more often. Now, Amor also sets a problem for married love. There is no point in getting married if you do not want to hear the truth about yourself, even all the things you really don't, do not want to hear. When two people live so close as couples do in marriage, the illusions of either one of them or both can be very costly to the other. Coming to the truth becomes desperately important. You really can't stand the illusions of the other person. Truth and marriage go together like horse and carriage. It's the very condition of marriage that neither spouse has a completely transparent presence to the other, and neither even has a clear-eyed understanding of self. The self-image of each of them can be greatly at variance with the reality of their lives. Nor can one perceive in all its contingencies and surprises all that the future holds in store for them and with what grave burdens it may jolt into their shoulders. That is why the couple who makes the commitment to give their lives to one another is in the end leaping into a kind of darkness. There is no other way. That leap can be rendered more reasonable and better founded if certain conditions are met. Let us hope that they have a long prepara preparation for staying down to earth laughing a lot in difficult times, keeping a good sense of humor at all times, even the most mortifying. They will also need to be prepared to forgive often and to ask forgiveness even more often. I mentioned that though the man must have the last word, the last word better be yes, dear. Um, and the sooner that's learned, the better. Chesterton described a married couple as a four-legged creature with one will. Hers. <laughs> and the sooner you learn that, the better. <laughs> At the same time, the husband needs to be the leader in speaking the truth. Why? Because he's more conceited <laughs> than she is. And he needs to learn to tell the truth gently, however hard. A good love cannot rest on illusion. When she is wrong, he needs to find a gentle, deft, almost invisible way of making that clear. But of course, all such requirements cannot be met. Those who marry are only human, not angels, and each has many small and large and awfully hugely annoying habits and tics. 
That is precisely why spousal love is so important to the human race. Nothing is closer to the human condition as, as spousal love. You're so close. There's so many ways to get on each other's nerves. Uh, it's nothing like it. Um, and it, it's the most human thing. This is also why both partners need to cherish an eros within them that leads them past the illusions of the myth of romantic love. The truth is that in the weeks following upon a sound marriage, the couple does not walk hand in hand into the sunset to live happily ever after. I, I hate to tell you this. Um, uh, actually, they will suffer much together in ways they cannot possibly foresee. Not much will depend on their romantic illusions. Almost everything will depend on their sense of humor and getting past their illusions one by one and doing as well as humans can do in the humdrum and jading of every day. There is who learn how to love and to keep love lively and young, even in mutual suffering, will have helped to create together the most wonderful of all friendships, as Thomas Aquinas called it. And creating this, they will have built something very beautiful for God, which mirrors God's own realistic love for his son and for all of us. Because you have to think, you know, God loved his son, but look what he did to his son. And you have to think, if this is what he does to his son, what can he do to us? What can he ask of us? So Christian love is not about romance and escape. It's about suffering. You know, humble love is about suffering. And it's very down to earth and uh, very grinding. So in a fascinating way, spousal love is at the nexus of all loves. Even the word of God keeps turning to spousal love when it needs an analogy for how the Lord God loves us and we him. Thank you very much.